Hello art friends, it's Anusha Said here. So, a few months ago, I posted a YouTube video basically talking about what my process was in illustrating a middle grade fantasy book cover um, for a major publisher. The book was called Silver World and it was actually entirely illustrated on the app Procreate on my iPad. So it was a really fun project. I went in depth into what it's like illustrating a book cover, going through all the steps from start to finish, um, how I got the gig, uh, what are the steps, and how you actually design a good book cover. So I actually got a lot of comments from people afterwards saying, you know, Anusha, you are a picture book illustrator. When are you gonna make a video talking about your picture book process? And to that I say, hey guys, Anusha here. So I'm going to be talking to you today about my picture book illustration process. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about this book right here. So this is I Am Perfectly Designed, written by Karamo Brown. Yes, the Karamo Brown. Um, also with uh, Jason Rachel Brown and illustrated by me. So this was published by Macmillan Press in uh, 2019, November. The book itself is really, really awesome. It was a super fun project to work on. It's basically about the love of a father and their son. You know, they spend their day walking through the city, through a park, and just reminisce about the time that they spent together, their love for each other, and they chat about all the ways that they're perfectly perfectly designed for each other. This is probably the most well-known book that I've worked on so far. You know, like I see it in Target all the time and every time I pass by it, I'm like, I did that, I did that. More recently, I Am Perfectly Designed was featured in this really awesome new Netflix series called Bookmarks. The show was released on September 1st. You can actually watch it right now. And it's, um, they basically, each episode features a book written by a black author, uh, read aloud by a black celebrity, and you know, it's a really awesome, awesome, important idea for a show, and I really encourage you guys to check it out. It's really well produced, well made, and the books that they feature are really great, and this could, you know, if you watch it with your little ones, could spark some really meaningful conversations about race, equality, compassion, and all of that good stuff. Anyway, I'm going to talk about my process and how I illustrated this book, step by step. The process of illustrating a picture book, for me at least, is different each time, which is kind of why I want to make this into a YouTube series, you know, going over all of the past books that I've worked on. Um, I also asked my Twitter and Instagram followers if they had any questions specifically about, you know, my illustration picture book process, so I'm also going to try to get to those too. And also, I'm wearing my Little Golden Books t-shirt. absolutely love this shirt. I got it at New York Comic Con last year and I did a little bit of embroidery on the text. This is the only embroidery project I will ever do in my life. This was really, really hard. Let's start by how I actually got this book project. Out of all of the social media platforms that I'm on, you know, Instagram, Tumblr, Twitter, etc., I personally believe that Twitter has been the most beneficial to my career. You know, I know you wouldn't think it because it's Twitter, but it's been a really great way for me to connect with art directors, you know, professionals in the industry as well as my peers. And I talk about this a lot in my Finding Art Directors video, which, you know, I'll link below. But, you know, I use Twitter by, you know, I can follow these art directors, hopefully they'll follow you back. Um, you'll have your work posted online and they'll be able to see it and, you know, hopefully think of you for future projects. And some art directors will post call to arts. Now, basically, these are posts where these art directors will tweet out like, hey, I have this project that I'm working on. I am looking for a specific type of illustrator for it. If you can do, for example, uh, if you're good at illustrating dragons and you've got like a very mm, vintage line art style, please reply with your portfolio link below. And then, you know, it's like a really good way for them to reach out and find potential new artists and, you know, new talent. So basically, one of the art directors that I follow, Mallory Griggs, she's super, super, super cool. Um, follow her on Twitter. She regularly posts call to arts that I've seen in the past. Um, and she's really good about trying to find new talent. She's really awesome. Uh, but basically, 
two-ish years ago, I think, she made a post saying that she was looking for an artist who is really good at illustrating lush plants and to just reply with your portfolio below. So I responded, even though honestly I don't think my plant drawings were really that good at the time, um, you know, but I think something must have stood out to her because, you know, later on I did get an email back and saying that, asking if I was available for this project and that she wanted to pitch me along with a couple other artists to Karamo and their team and I, in the end, I was chosen. Awesome. Let's start off with our first question. So, do you do character designs before you start and how do you keep your characters from looking consistent on every page? So, working on this book and every other book, after all of the contracts and finances and all the boring stuff is sorted out, I was sent over the manuscript, you know, like the entire text of the story and descriptions of the characters, and we started on the character design stage. Now, this is actually my favorite part in doing any picture book or whatever, because I also work as a character designer for animation. And so I think I'm kind of good at this. <laughs> you know, some children's books that I've worked on don't exactly have a dedicated character design stage, but even if they don't have one, I try to put it in anyway because I really feel like you're going to be spending the entire book with this character and so you really want to take some time to make sure that their design is really well thought out, that you figure out what the style of the book is and make sure you kind of figure it out with your art team, you know, the publisher as well, so you have a design that everyone really loves. This final character design that I make, as in the one that's completely approved, like a fully illustrated, just like full body image of this character is also what I use as reference for the entire book. So what I'll usually do is that I have a really tough time keeping consistent with my characters from page to page. Um, it, you know, like the eyes will be too big on one page, the head will be kind of like weird and whatever. So what I usually do is I just literally copy paste that reference image whenever I'm working on a page and we'll just refer back to it to make sure it all looks consistent. And in the future, I think I will also, just for myself, I would also, instead of, apart from just doing like the full front-facing view of the character, I'd also do a side or three-quarter, just so that, you know, I put in the effort to create a full turnaround. I did something similar for this book of mine that very recently came out, Monster and Boy, and it really helped me when I had to draw the character in kind of a weird angle and I could very easily refer back to my initial reference drawings. So knowing that this book is based off of Karamo's life, um, I came up with a couple of possible directions for the characters. Normally, doing the character design stage, I come up with like three to five different designs and I try to vary them as much as possible. So, you know, in the hopes that the client is able to find something they like between them and I also remind the client that you know if you don't like one particular design what's more helpful is that you know you can tell me oh I like the hair on design A, I like the eyes on B, I like the the clothes on C and the body type on D and I can just Frankenstein and merge all of those different aspects together and hopefully the client is able to you know maybe appreciate that a little bit more and we can kind of gear towards what exactly they like. So I did these three different uh, designs for the kid character and in the end they decided on this one and I just made a couple of changes towards like the final design and in terms of the dad, his design was a lot easier because you know it's pretty much based off of Karamo, you know the writer. Um, the main challenge for me was because it's essentially a caricature. You know, I am not really good at that kind of stuff, I'm not really good at resemblances, and I'm also not good at drawing male adults. So that was a tricky part for me, but eventually we were able to come up with this design. One thing I'll note in hindsight, looking at both of these characters side by side, the ones that are approved, is that they don't really look like they're from the same book. The boy is more stylized, you know, with his big old head while the dad is looking much more realistic. In fact, it kind of it's kind of like when you see a celebrity, an animated celebrity cameo in a cartoon show and they 
just looks so out of place from the rest of the cast. I'm thinking like Arthur and stuff like that. It just looks really, really weird. So in the final art, I did make sure to tweak both of the designs slightly so that they better fit together stylistically. So just keep in mind when you're doing the character design stage, don't design your characters separately, but as an ensemble. Making sure that they look good together in terms of style, that they all look like they're from the same project. Both in terms of design as well as color, you're going to be seeing these characters together all the time. So it's a good idea to make sure that the colors that you choose for both of them complement each other. After the character design stage, it usually goes one of two ways. Either we go straight into the interior sketching, or we work on the cover. So normally the cover is done at the very end of a project. This is because, you know, by then you've completed all of the spreads and you have a better handle on, you know, actually drawing the characters as well as, you know, you kind of figure out the interior and you can refer back to anything you've drawn inside as like an Easter egg or foreshadowing onto the cover. But sometimes you do the cover art first, which is what I did for this project. In this case, because it was a high profile book, the marketing team would need to have the final cover art as soon as possible so that they're able to market it and promote it, promote it <laughs> um, as you do the interior work. Initially, we wanted the cover to lean heavily on plant motifs. So I came up with a couple of concepts for the cover that focus on that. We knew that we wanted to have the dad and the son on there, you know, a bunch of lush plants, and personally, I wanted to play around with some fun typography. For cover concepts, again, I usually send three to five. You can see that they are super, super rough, mostly sketches with a little bit of shading for clarity. We weren't really feeling these designs and we decided to instead shift the symbolism from plants into more community instead and uh, more centered around the message of being perfectly designed exactly the way you are. So I did a few more cover concepts after I got those notes in my round two. And you can see that these ones have a stronger focus on that community symbolism to there and focusing on having lots of people in the background with you know very diverse backgrounds. And after some back and forth, um, eventually we decided to merge a couple of these designs together and we landed on this design with the dad and son sitting together in a park. And now we get to painting. So I normally don't do, what's the word, color blocking, you know, which is when you roughly plan out your colors before you get to the final paint, kind of like thumbnailing or something. I personally like to improvise and just figure out my colors as I work on the piece, but the art director did want to see a couple of possible different color versions that she could approve before we moved on to the final. And honestly, I'm glad that we did go this route. In this case, there were so many different ways we could have gone with the color and I actually went crazy and did 10 different versions um, and, you know, all different types of mood, timing, locations. Usually the first design that I do is the one that I end up loving and I don't really <laughs> explore any further and I just stick with the first one. But in this case, it did take a couple of explorations and trials to get through it before we found the one. I don't know if this was going to be interesting for you guys or not, but I thought I would break down my thought process for each of the different color concepts that I came up with and order from the first one that I did to the last one, just in case it's helpful for someone out there. Um, <laughs> I never really know what's interesting for viewers and I just don't want to gloss over anything. Just I'm just trying to be helpful, I don't know. So if this part is boring, please let me know and I won't do it again in the future, I guess. Okay, let's go. Number one. This is just a regular scene in the park. Lots of greenery, kind of the colors you'd immediately come up with and expect to use when, if you have a line art like this. It's fine for a first pass, but it's all, I don't know, kind of generic and boring even. I definitely wanted a unique color palette going into this project and this wasn't it. Number two, here I'm trying to go for a more autumnal, autumnal vibe. <laughs> I thought that maybe having the book take place in the fall could be kind of interesting and give it a more nostalgic feel, a nostalgic vibe to it. Here the people in the background are also fully painted with colors. I think it's cute, but personally I think that the colors were a little bit too muted for a cover, especially if it's something that's supposed to catch your eye in a bookstore. Number three, 
again, autumnal, but we are getting a little bit brighter now. Number four. So, okay, now we're getting somewhere. We're still in the warm tones, but it's definitely brighter and more saturated now. The people in the background are still fully colored. And at this point, I realized that I really liked using blue for Karama's jacket and kind of really made it pop out. But that also meant that since his jacket is blue, I couldn't have blue as the color of the sky, otherwise it would blend in too much. So you'll notice that in all of my color concepts, I never use the color blue. Kind of interesting. Number five, this is the fifth design I drew and the one that the team decided on using in the end. But don't worry, I'm gonna show you the ones that I did after this as well in my brainstorming session. The colors are bright and warm, but this time the people in the back are stylized and they kind of have just like a monochrome color palette. They're all in like that orangey warmy color scheme. And this keeps that warmth to the illustration and still makes sure that all of the attention is on our two main characters and they really contrast against the warm colors in the back. Number six. So this one is pretty similar to the one before, but the color tones are inverted. So the people in the back are now cool toned and the trees are warm. I really liked this one at the time. This was my personal favorite because the colors are kind of weird and I kind of like that. But I'm really glad that the team decided on the one before this. I think that was the right call. Number seven, this is funny. So at this point, I realized that eventually when I got to the final paint stage, I would have to paint all of those background people. And so I came up with a version where those people didn't exist and I wouldn't have to paint them, hoping that maybe the publisher would like that, but they didn't. So <laughs> number eight, I thought I'd mix things up a bit and try to play around with the time of day and now we have it moving more towards like a sunset lighting you know something moody number nine another sunset one getting a little bit darker number 10 picture books at night so i did think that this was a really pretty cover and has a lot of potential but since the book doesn't take place at night it doesn't really make much sense anyway now we move on to the final illustration so just to note this entire book uh, like my book cover video that I did was entirely illustrated on the app Procreate on my uh, second generation iPad Pro 10.5 inch. Since then I have upgraded to the most newest model that at the time I was using the second generation and I pretty much used only two brushes and that would be the Bonobo Chalk and the HP Pencil, both which are default found on Procreate. Um, I use other brushes as well and maybe I'll do like a demo video one day, but for this particular book, those two brushes were literally the only ones I used. Since this is wrap art for the cover, I don't know if that's a technical word for it, but it's basically like the back and the front are just one illustration that are just like wrapped around the cover. Um, it's a continuous illustration and that means it was a pretty big file. I think the final dimensions were something like uh, 5,326 pixels by 3,300 pixels at 300 dpi. Uh, I worked in RGB and I had a bleed of 0.25. So technically I was supposed to work in CMYK, but at the time Procreate didn't have the function the capability to work in CMYK. So I worked in RGB and I just asked my art director who was very kind enough to convert it to CMYK in-house. I don't really have much to say about the painting process over here. Since I had the color reference beforehand, it was just pretty easy to work on top of it and color pick my way through it. Also, in this case, the publisher was the one who designed the typography for, you know, the, the title and the author notes and whatever, as well as any text in the book. Generally, it is done in-house. Sometimes I will have a say in, or like be able to design the title and the author things like I did for Monster and Boy, another book I did, but in this case, I did not. After the cover, we start working on the interiors. That was flawless. Depending on the project, the art director or the editor will, along with the manuscript, provide the illustrator some art notes, you know, some kind of direction on what exactly to draw on inside of each page. Um, but depending on the project, how details, how detailed the notes will be will also change. Well, for example, when I illustrated the book series Hank the Pet Sitter, the art director gave me very, very specific instructions on what to draw on every page, going from like exactly what were they wearing, what their positions are like, and even 
mapping out on the page how much space the illustration should take up. They're very, very, very detailed with their uh, notes. However, for I'm Perfectly Designed, it's complete opposite. They didn't give me any notes and complete creative freedom. Most picture books will end up somewhere in between the two extremes, which is actually what I usually prefer because, you know, I like some amount of direction to give me an idea of where I should start, but not so much that I do have the creative freedom to do whatever I want. Don't get me wrong, I love that I could do whatever I wanted with the story and I could interpret the manuscript however I liked, but without a little bit of direction, it is a bit overwhelming, especially in this case with this book. The story is uh, a bit abstract, pretty much entirely this beautiful conversation between a father and his son, you know, involving a lot of emotions and conceptual situations um, and not really stating any settings or descriptions or actions, which is kind of tricky to figure out like how, how do you exactly draw like a like a concept. This happened to me before with another book I illustrated called How I Did It, which is really great. It's basically about uh, the letter I who wants to go away from the alphabet and become its own person. It's really fun, but again, a lot of conceptual ideas and figuring out how to draw that was tricky. But I also think there is definitely a kind of a fun challenge you can find in that sort of thing to, you know, like a problem solving thing to like find the best way to illustrate something conceptual when there isn't any indication to what's going on in the background. So in the end, me and the art director, we kind of decided that I would illustrate the characters having this conversation while going on a kind of day trip around the city. And it's not stated in the text that they're doing that, but I felt that it was needed to sort of ground the story a little bit. People think writing for children is easy, but it's really not. Um, I'm currently writing my own projects and I'm starting to find out that it is a lot harder than it looks. So one of the reasons why picture books are so complex and difficult is the fact that most of major publishers, they require that picture book manuscripts be no longer than 500 words, which really isn't a lot. So because of this, you know, you can only have so much text in a book and writers have to be economical about the words that they choose and, you know, tell their stories efficiently as they can and get rid of all of like the fluff and descriptors and other things that you don't really need to tell in the story. Josh Funk, who is a really cool children's book writer, he has written a really great guide to writing for Kidlet, which I'll make sure to link below, but uh, here's one example he shows for making words count. As sweat dripped slowly on Luke's face, he stood with his blue lightsaber in his right hand. The evil Darth Vader had to be stopped before he could do even more harm to the galaxy. While it's written well, a lot of it is pretty unnecessary and you can rewrite those 36 words with just these 11. Luke stood ready to fight. Darth Vader had to be stopped. It's concise to the point and follows the rule of show don't tell. And all of the descriptors like Sweaty Luke and his blue lightsaber can be shown in the art instead. Because of economical storytelling, it's up to the illustrator to fill in all of the story that the author is unable to. When the author and illustrator work together and make a good team, the text and the art will complement each other and flow together seamlessly. That's all teamwork. At this point, I start sketching out my rough ideas for the interiors of the book. So I don't think I can really share all of the rough work I did, but I'll go over what I try to look out for and then focus on the progression of one of the pages that I did. So I like working on the sketches in chronological order. You don't have to, you can draw in whatever order you like, but it's what makes sense to me in terms of how the story flows. Sometimes if I get stuck on a page, I'll skip it and leave all the hard pages to the end. You can see that these are extremely rough. I'm just trying to get across my concept for the spread. I don't really care about keeping the characters on model. Like they can have like a big old head on one page and like tiny the other. At this point, it's just like really rough and I can always clean it up at a later stage. I also like working on a smaller dimension than what the final illustration will be. I find that working small, uh, my lines are a lot looser and a little bit more fluid as opposed to on a big canvas. So I'll do all of the sketching and stuff on the small canvas, but just make sure when you go to final, you make it the correct size later because I have forgotten to do that in the past and it's not fun redoing an entire illustration. I also think that when you're sketching and painting that it's important that you do it as a spread, 
meaning that you're working simultaneously on the two pages that face each other rather than page by page. Even if you're not drawing an illustration that takes up the entire spread and you're only working on one page or you're creating a bunch of spots that don't really like have anything to do with each other, in the final book the reader is still going to open it up and see like the whole thing out open like that. So it's really important that, you know, you make sure all the art in the page looks cohesive to each other and, you know, in terms of color and composition, even if it's all separate art. Does that make sense? Apart from keeping in mind what the art looks like in terms of a spread, in general, you should just be thinking about what your book looks like on a larger scale as an entire book. I like that on Procreate, I can literally zoom out and see all of my pages at once and easily swipe through them. This way you can make sure there is a flow to the story and that none of the pages feel out of place or worse, even boring. For example, my favorite way to illustrate a page is to do a big, beautiful spread instead of having single page illustrations or spots. That's just my style. But of course, if you have like that big, beautiful spread on every single page, it kind of gets a bit repetitive and boring and you kind of lose that impact too. By adding in some pages which have a more simpler composition and some white space, you can give your complex spreads a bigger impact when it counts. For example, I have a spread here that basically feels like almost two one-page illustrations with lots of white space, followed by a page with a bunch of spots, and then the next page is just a big, fully illustrated spread. Because I had those simpler pages earlier, once you get to that spread, like the impact is so much stronger than it would have been if all of the pages looked exactly like this. Also, keep in mind that when you're working on a spread, make sure you don't draw anything important in the middle, like on the spine, just in case um, it might end up getting cut out or hidden in the fold. So avoid drawing faces there, for example. I could talk for hours analyzing every single one of these pages. So let's just do one for now and break it down. Here's one spread where dad and son are walking across the street having a serious talk with a crowd of people around them. I wanted to illustrate them in a crowd because I wanted the mood to feel a little cinematic in the sense of I wanted to have like all of these city people bustling around them and then somehow we're able to look past them and focus on just the two of them as if you know, they're the only people that matter in the world. Again, this is another case of showing rather than telling. As an illustrator, you have so much opportunity to create story through visual. Like in terms of staging, I have the camera at a slight overhead so that they feel a bit smaller and more insecure and kind of at an angle so there's a bit of tension and uneasiness as well. After I complete my initial sketches for the interiors, I send them over to the art director. Eventually, they, you know, they'll look through everything and then they'll get back to me with some notes and revisions that they have in mind. Sometimes the publisher will have zero notes for me and then I can move straight to color, but that doesn't usually happen. It's usually because um, of time restraints and not because I got everything right. Um, for this book, I definitely got a lot of notes um, for every page, but they were really necessary. After taking in all of that feedback, I would revise the sketches following those notes and then send them back to the art director. They'd look over it. If everything was okay at this point, then I would move to color. You'll see at this stage that I've also cleaned up the sketches a little bit and made sure that the characters are on model because at this point we are getting closer to the final stage of coloring and titles. My main note I got for this page was that in terms of the timeline of the story, it wouldn't make sense for the characters to still be in the city. They should still be in the park by now. This is why I changed the setting to a farmer's market instead. Secondly, the direction that they're walking. Regarding composition, and I think I'll have to make a whole other video for it one day, but basically, as an illustrator, you have the ability to decide how a reader will look at a page. You can design your spread in a way where you can guide the reader's eyes in whichever direction you want. It's basically a superpower. Composition can be a storytelling tool, and you'll see that I changed the direction that the characters are walking in, to left to right. Like I said in my book cover video, we as Western audiences read from left to right, so because our eyes are reading from the left, the action should as well. I basically make this change throughout the entire book because I make that error a lot of them going in the wrong direction. And so because the story is of our, of our characters essentially, you know, walking through the city in a general direction, I always make sure to keep them moving from left to right. So if they were if the, they went from right to left at any point in the book, it would kind of break the flow 
um, and it would actually mess with your head a little bit. They're like, oh, why did they stop? Why are they changing directions? If they're always moving in one direction, you kind of get the flow that like, okay, they are, they're in motion. In this piece, I also place the characters over here on the right, which subconsciously tells us that there has been movement in the drawing, that they must have started from here and ended here. It's kind of a cool subconscious trick in showing the passage of time in a still image. So there's this awesome book. I think I have it here. Yeah, I have it here. Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. Really, really awesome book, especially if you ever want to draw comics or just understand how they work. It's, uh, it's super, super cool. But basically, um, it covers composition and creating the illusion illusion of time and space in a drawing. Um, and even though it's mostly about comics, a lot of the info is still applicable to picture books um, and I'll make sure to leave a link to it below. When the publisher sends me the page template with like the manuscript laid out, sometimes the publisher will have already arranged exact the text exactly where they want it to be on the page. And I just have to draw my artwork around it. Uh, sometimes with this book, they give me the text separately and then the blank page and then they can, they'll be like, put the text wherever you want, you can just do whatever you want. And then later on, they'll be the ones who actually put in the text on the page once it comes to like their in-house design. I just decide like, decide where I want the text to be, if that makes sense. Text placement is extremely important and when you're designing your page and composition, it's crucial you keep in mind where your text is going to go. I can clearly tell when an artist has left their kit text placement to the last minute and it usually feels like the text has been forcefully shoved into the illustration as an afterthought, just like squeezing into an empty spot. Um, it just feels really out of place. The text should feel like it's a part of the illustration, not that like they're two separate things. Uh, they should blend seamlessly into each other. And I don't think that it's enough that you just leave a blank space of where the art, of where the text should go in your artwork, but that you try to frame your uh, your text with your artwork. So it really feels like it's, it's just together. This is the back cover, but I think it pretty effectively shows what I'm trying to say over here. So with all the elements that are surrounding the text over here, immediately you're going to see the text first because it's like dark writing on a blank background. But then, you know, you go to the text first and then your eye follows the tree over here. It follows the curve of the tree down to the girl, to the kid over here, to the puppy, to the other people over here, up to the tree and around. And so this way, the reader is able to take in all of the artwork. And if, for example, let's say I got rid of one of the elements here or the tree, your eye would kind of get confused. Like it would follow the pattern and then worse, like maybe you have like the tree instead of like pointing this way, it points upwards. Your eye would end up following the tree and going upwards. Um, it might end up ruining the eye guide and then the reader won't really know where to look. I don't know if I'm explaining this properly, but I hope, I hope you guys understand. Composition video will come one day. Don't worry about it. Hopefully at this point, all of the interior sketches have been approved by the publisher, it all looks good, and now we can move on to color. Normally I go straight into final color when I'm working on a project, but because this was a high profile project and they wanted to approve everything before the finals, uh, the publisher did want to see the color blocking step for all of the pages as well. It's nothing fancy, I just kept my original sketch on one layer and did some flat colors underneath with very minimal shading if it's important for the storytelling. Choosing a color palette was important for this book because it served a storytelling purpose and there are some pages that switch between the present and the past. We decided to make the pages that take place in the present to take place in spring and the ones in the past take place in autumn. We need to make it very clear that you could immediately tell what time period it was just by looking at the page and we did that through color. Apart from having falling leaves in the autumn time for like the scenes in the past, the overall color palette of the past is very warm. You know, there are lots of oranges and reds, the green, all the green, like the grass and everything has a yellow tone to it and the tree trunks are brown. In contrast, the scenes in the present are much cooler. So, you know, all the greens are more on the bluer side this time and even the tree trunks are blue. You can see this effect most clearly on this page where you have the past and present just like right there together. 
even in my character design, I tried to bring in that contrast, uh, making sure that the colors on dad were cool and the colors on the kid were warm. The book has our two characters spending the day in the park, and as the day goes on, the daylight turns to sunset, and you can clearly see the slow progression of the colors changing in the last few pages. For the sunset pages, I kind of wanted the color palette to be a mixture of the past and present, combining warm reds and cool blues to end up with a purpley palette somewhere in the middle. I was hoping that this color palette would symbolize the love that the two share for each other, uh, something that transcends time no matter the past, present, or future. Finally, with the color blocking approved, we move on to the final paint. This is when I stop working on the small canvas and size up. Make sure you remember to do that. For this book, the file dimensions were, and I'm just going to read this because I can't remember it, 8.5 by 11 inch with a 0.25 bleed on the outer edges. And because I'm working on spreads this and not single pages, this ended up being 17.25 by 11.25, and this is including the bleed already. I always include the bleed when I'm drawing. And this was at 300 dpi. So this is a pretty large, large file. And at the time when I illustrated this book, Procreate didn't really have the capability for large files. And basically with Procreate, the larger your file size is, the fewer layers they allow you to draw on. To, sorry, not the verb. The fewer layers it allows you to uh, draw on. So I think I was allowed a maximum of 30 layers, which isn't a lot. <laughs> I didn't have much of a choice though, so I think what I did was uh, my, work around, my workaround was just merging as I went along and making sure that like only the important, the most important elements got their own layers. I don't have much to say about the painting part, maybe I'll do a demo in the future, but it's pretty much the same thing that I did for the cover. Here you can see the progress from sketch to finished art. Some of the pages are perfect from the beginning and don't need any changes, and some are pretty unrecognizable by the end of it. commercial artist, it's really important that you don't get too attached to your own work since you're creating it for a client and you want to make them happy. I got a lot of notes and while all of the notes I received made a lot of sense, while it's hard to let go of your ideas, you kind of have to. Like for example, there's one page in the book where the sketch was, I, I love the sketch for this page, but unfortunately the manuscript changed and the, that scene was entirely cut out. It's sad, but it happens. That's just the way it goes. Or on this page, I was trying to go for something abstract with these sort of flowing colors and just trying to draw what the emotion of a hug would look like visually. The publisher felt that it was a bit too abstract and didn't fit with the rest of the book. And I agreed. And in the final, it's much more grounded in reality with colors that match the rest of the book. If there's a change that I feel really strongly about, I'll bring it up and try to fight for it. But in the end, it's really up to the publisher and you have to be prepared to let it go. Finally, I send over all of the finished pages and if everything is good, then that's it, you're done. I don't have to worry about actually placing the text or worrying about the bleed and printing and all of that kind of stuff. That's done in-house. From signing contracts to submitting the final art, I believe this took about five months to do and was released six months later. This is a much faster time than what's normal, but it's <laughs> what I've been used to these days. I don't know, like the industry is getting really, really quick, quick, quick these days, but I know Every project is different. I think in this case, they were trying to get it ready for the Christmas season. And so that's why the turnaround time was kind of short. But there are other books that I've worked on, which I've been given like nine months to work on and it comes out a year and a half later. I kind of prefer when it's all like a short, short turnaround just so I can have the finished book in my hand ASAP. And that's pretty much it. Illustrating a picture book from start to finish. Um, I hope this might have answered some of your questions on what the process of illustrating a book is like. There are a couple of questions that people ask that I didn't get around to, but hopefully I can make another video about it someday. Maybe I can do a question answer video. So if that's something interesting, let me know in the comments and I'll try to do that one day. As a reminder, I'm perfectly designed as well as a bunch of 
other very, very excellent books are featured in the new Netflix series, Bookmarks. Um, it's a really well-made, important show, and I highly recommend that you guys check it out. And also consider supporting those creators and checking their books out. I think my, oh, my cat is scratching at the door. Kitty, I'm almost done. If you want to support my art, then, you know, you can head over to my shop. It is anushasay.com slash shop and I sell tons of prints and other goodies like tote bags and baseball caps um, and if you want to purchase a copy of I Am Perfectly Designed, I'll leave a link below um, but if you're able to support your local bookshops, please do so. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Foxville underscore art. I post my artwork as well as other advice type of things. Um, and you can find my portfolio website at tanushasay.com. If you have any ideas for future videos or, you know, you think I missed something today, please let me know in the comments below and I'll try to get back to that someday. <laughs> I know you guys are waiting on part two of my agents video and don't worry, I'm still working on it. It's just uh, got a little bit sidelined because it's so research heavy and I've been so busy these past few weeks. Um, so it's September 1st for me right now as I'm filming. And if you're watching it in the future when it's, re it's released, it's September 13th. And, um, well, I got married last night, as in September 12th. So <laughs> I hope it was fun. I'll find out in the future and I'll let you guys know. Um, but I'm also in the process of moving. So in the next video, you'll see a very different background behind me. Hopefully still bright. We shall see. We shall see. Also, speaking of the agent video that I posted, um, thank you so much for all of the positive feedback. Um, I'm really glad it was helpful for all of you. This is really a labor of love and I'm just trying to, you know, I'm taking in your feedback and trying to make these videos better. Like I got a new camera, uh, I got a new fancy professional camera. I'm still working on the audio though. I'll, I got a mic coming in the mail, so hopefully next video that'll be better as well. But yeah, just know guys, I'm trying to make these videos as helpful and as informative as I can and I hope you guys are enjoying them. But with that, I gotta get back to wedding planning. I got two weeks left until the big day, but as I sign off, I'll just end this video with a time lapse of one of the pages that I worked on. Hope you enjoy it and as always, have a wonderful day. Bye.